presidential assent brings into force the new Land Reforms Act in Kerala. Surplus land was surveyed and demarcated for redistribution. At a ceremony at Tadupuza, about 6,000 title deeds are given to the landless. Kerala witnessed massive social change in the late 1960s. In 1967, the Communist Party of India stormed to power in the state after a decade-long turf war with the Congress and other rivals. The new Chief Minister EMS Nambudripad was set on delivering land reforms. Religious establishments had so far been exempt from having their land taken over. But in August of 1968, the government revoked that exemption. Among the people it affected was the young head monk of the Ednir Mud. Keshwanand Bharti, Keral ke Kasar Gold Stith, Ednir Hindu Mud ke Pramukh the, aur Keral Sarkar ke Bhumi Sudhar Kanun ko Supreme Court mein chunauti di thi, jisme dharmik sampatti ke prabandhan par pabandi lagai gayi thi. According to legend, Totakacharya, one of the four main disciples of Adi Shankaracharya, set up the Ednir Mud as a center for Advaita philosophy. It held 681 acres of lush green land in Kasargod, in northern Kerala. And the Mutt earned income by letting out its land to local farmers, who cultivated cashew and mango, jackfruit, coconut and arica nut. Keshavnanda Bharati took over as the head monk of the Ednir Mutt at the age of 19, in 1960. Nambudripad's amendment would severely cut his mutt's holding. And Keshavananda was desperate to avoid that. So he turned to a well-known lawyer with roots in a neighbouring village, barrister M.K. Nambiar. Nambiar, who we met in the first episode, agreed to help the young monk. March 1970. A few months after the amendment, Nambiar and his colleague J.B. Dada Chandri a solicitor in Delhi, filed a petition in the Supreme Court. Keshavananda Bharti's petition was not unique. It was one of hundreds of challenges to land reform laws before the court. But the events of 1971 would change the fate of Keshavananda's petition. And with it, the political history of India. We ended the last episode at Indira Gandhi's massive victory in the 1971 general elections. After the upheavals of her previous term, Gandhi was relieved to be running a government that had a full majority in parliament. It meant that she could finally pursue the ambitious program of reforms that had won her such exceptional popularity with the voting public. But it would also put her directly on a collision course with the courts. I'm your host, Raghu Karnad, and this is Friend of the Court. On the 2nd of April, 1971, the Lok Sabha was debating the President's opening address all morning. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's turn to speak came at half past noon. She laid out her new government's priorities, and economic self-reliance was a running theme in her speech. About halfway in, Gandhi made it clear that her government was keen on nationalizing key industrial sectors, so that resources would be, quote, deployed in the best possible manner. She said that the government saw, quote, a growing and dominant role for the public sector. In its previous term, the government had nationalized 14 major private banks. And as we heard in the last episode, the court struck down this measure. Namita Wahi, a land rights expert 
and a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, explains why. The court said that there were a few issues with uh, the bank nationalization ordinance. The first being that the compensation that was paid to the banks for nationalization of their property, it said was illusory compensation because it was in the nature of bonds that had a very long uh, period of maturing, which meant that not only was the entire business of the banks taken over, but they had no way of starting any other business. It was really not any compensation that they could use in this moment. The second reason was that only these 14 banks had been nationalized and other banks could still continue to do their business and new banks could be set up. There was no prohibition on that. So the court found this to be an unreasonably discriminatory classification against these 14 banks. In short, the court ruled that the bank nationalization policy had violated the fundamental rights to equality and property. In its fresh term, the government acted swiftly to preempt such inconvenient rulings. Gandhi appointed three of her most trusted lieutenants, Siddhartha Shankar Re, H.R. Gokhale, and Mohan Kumar Mangalam, to key ministries. Re was a dapper, six foot four inch tall lawyer and a former minister in West Bengal before he began advising his lifelong friend, Hindu, on political strategy. He was given the education ministry. The 55 year old H.R. Gokhale became law minister, a role historically held by prominent lawyer turned politicians such as B.R. Ambedkar. Gokhale was one of the lawyers who argued for the government in the Golaknath case. But the former trade union lawyer and Bombay High Court judge was not an obvious choice for the job. He'd entered politics just five years earlier. And of those, he'd spent only two years in the Congress. But what he lacked in experience, he made up for in strong ideological credentials. Rounding out the trio was Mohan Kumaramangalam. He was a Cambridge-educated lawyer, a former card-carrying member of the Communist Party of India and a friend of Indira Gandhi. Former Attorney General K.K. Venugopal was a close friend of Kumaramangalam and he tells us more about him. He was brilliant and though he had lost a large number of years of practice having devoted, having devoted himself to politics and to the Communist Marxist Party, he picked up the law in no time and started arguing very big cases in the Supreme Court as well as in the High Court. And I remember uh, I had a big car at that time and uh, which was parked in my father's uh, uh, house, compound. Uh, he had more than enough money to buy any number of, uh, this was a Buke, which I had uh, bought from the STC in Delhi. And uh, he looked at that car and uh, walk, walked through all from that and told me this is something which I cannot buy. Not that I cannot afford it, but as a communist, I can't be seen in a car like this. He joined the Congress in 1967 and sided with Gandhi when the party split in 1969 over political disagreements. The old guard of the Congress was aghast at Gandhi's populist moves to abolish the privy purses and to nationalize banks. But Kumar Manglam was galvanized by her resolve. He soon became a strong influence and he succeeded in pushing far-left ideas to the center of party discourse. In 1971, he was appointed as the Minister for Steel and Mines. He was very close to Indira Gandhi. And I remember uh, his telling me that she had asked him as to whether he would be prepared to be her attorney general. Frustrated with the way in the judiciary was striking down uh, uh, laws, right and left. And that is how we made that very strong statement, uh, saying that confrontation with the judiciary and so on. Kumar Manglam was a vigorous advocate of changing the constitution to suit the government's ideals. He had been one of the government's lawyers in the bank nationalization case. He lamented that the court's ruling in favor of the fundamental right to property paralyzed efforts to usher in a more egalitarian society. The 1971 election results had barely sunk in when Kumar Mangalam, Gokhale and Ray rolled up their sleeves and began plotting to weaken property rights. To justify their moves, the ministers turned to a different part of the constitution. 
Directive principles essentially are principles of governance. Now, the most basic principle is laid down in Article 38, which is that ultimately all legislation must see to it that there is justice, not in the sense of what we administer in courts of law, but justice that is social, economic, and political. That was from a lecture by Justice Rowington Nariman, a former Supreme Court judge, in which he explains the directive principles of state policy. These are the Constitution's broad guidelines for policymaking. The principles are a mishmash of ideas, ranging from implementing a uniform civil code to promoting cottage industries to preventing cow slaughter. Unlike fundamental rights, directive principles cannot be enforced by the courts. Rather, they're ideals guiding the governance of the country. The one that Kumar Mangalam and his comrades were most interested in was Article 39. 39 is a very, very important article which you must keep in mind again for the purposes of future discussion, which is that the material resources of the community must be distributed so as best to subserve what is called the common good. The Indira Gandhi government seized on this principle. It argued that this was an essential provision to create economic opportunities and a more equal society, even if it came at the cost of individual freedoms. The government used Article 39 to attack property rights. In 1971, Kumar Mangalam published a report titled Constitutional Amendments – The Reason Why. Here he argued that constitutional amendments were needed to subordinate the fundamental rights of the individual, quote, to meet the urgent needs of society. All of this sounded good in theory, but there was a catch. It came by way of the 1967 Golaknath Judgment. As we heard in episode one, this was the judgment that said Parliament could not amend fundamental rights. So what does they say that first we must overrule Golaknath? But how do we overrule Golaknath when you have got these judges like that? So then they said we will ask for the relook at Golaknath by passing an amendment. And the Supreme Court will have to then consider whether Golaknath is correct to even nullify this amendment. This is T.R. Andhya Rujina, the late senior advocate and former Solicitor General, who eventually appeared for the government in the Keshavananda Bharti case. This clip is from a 2015 public lecture he gave. His hair is snow white, his spectacles perched on his hooked nose. Andhya Rujina was visibly animated throughout his hour-long speech. As he recounted, the government planned to introduce an amendment to undo the Golaknath judgment. On July 28, 1971, at 12.53 in the afternoon, Law Minister H.R. Gokhale rose to introduce the 24th Amendment in the Lok Sabha. The amendment would give Parliament back the power to change any provision of the Constitution, even the fundamental rights. We spoke to lawyer and constitutional scholar Gautam Bhatia about what the 24th Amendment proposed to do. The government consistently maintained that it had a plenary constituent power to amend all provisions of the constitution, unfettered by substantive judicial review. And uh, in response to Kolaknath, uh, the government through parliament moved to crystallize that position into the constitution. Constituent power is the power used to create or repeal a constitution. The government's view is simple. Article 368 gave Parliament absolute power to change the Constitution. And that's what the 24th Amendment spelled out. Article 13 prevented the government from making a law that violates fundamental rights. So the government simply went ahead and changed that. The 24th Amendment, for example, uh, added uh, uh, to Article 13, uh, Clause 4, that specifically said that Nothing in this article shall apply to any amendment of this constitution made under Article 368. By doing this, the government was saying fundamental rights could not stand in the way of constitutional amendments. Law Minister Gokhale said in the Lok Sabha that restricting parliament, the only popularly elected branch of government, from changing the constitution went against the very idea of parliamentary democracy. And it was arresting the country's progress. The amending process was a, quote, safety valve, which protected the constitution from decay. 
But not everyone bought the government's thesis. Pilu Modi, the Swatantra Party MP from Godra, responded with one word, slavery. The amendment came under severe criticism outside parliament too. Our Indian mind is today conditioned to think that unless the fundamental rights are amended, directive principles cannot be implemented. Thousands of people gathered at Loyola College in Madras in 1971 to hear this talk. I ask one simple question. This scheme of economic reform which is wisely conceived and honestly implemented has ever been defeated by our fundamental rights. They had all come to listen to the man you just heard, Nani Palkiwala. Point out to me one scheme of any state, any central, uh, any state government or any central government, not one. You will not find one scheme being defeated by the fundamental rights, not one. The fundamental rights are there as the iron framework within which your salvation can be reached and you can work out your great destiny. And finally, may I say this, that our constitution as it stands today without the amendment will ensure that this great nation can have stability without stagnation and change without the destruction of human values. Thank you. You can hear the spontaneous outbursts of applause from the Madras crowd that evening. By 1971, Palkhiwala had been on the winning side of three important cases against the government. Golaknath, bank nationalization, and privy purses. He spoke at public events organized by the Forum for Free Enterprise, which believes in free markets and limited state involvement in economic affairs. In his rousing rhetorical style, he analyzed the implications of the 24th Amendment. This very parliament has told you at the time when it passed the 24th Amendment as to what it proposes to do once it is given the power to abridge fundamental rights under the 24th Amendment. And it has told you that by introducing in parliament the 25th Amendment Bill. Which tells you quite frankly, I must give full marks for frankness to this parliament. It tells you quite frankly what it proposes to do once it has been given the power to abridge fundamental rights. As Palkiwala pointed out, the 24th Amendment merely laid the groundwork for another amendment, one that the law minister introduced on the same afternoon. Here's Gautam Bhatia again. So alongside the 24th Amendment, you have the 25th Amendment, uh, which uh, curtailed the right to uh, property. It um, uh, again altered the property clauses. And uh, crucially, uh, it said that... Uh, any law giving effect to Article 39 B and C of the Directive Principles of State Policy uh, would be exempted from judicial review, even if it violated the fundamental rights. So it sought to uh, effectively uh, close off uh, certain uh, laws bl- uh, from judicial review in a blanket way, uh, where, which would uh, prevent the courts from, uh, from testing those laws. The 25th Amendment came up for debate in November 1971. In the Lok Sabha, Law Minister Gokhale said the amendment would enable a, quote, far-reaching program aimed at restructuring the entire socio-economic fabric of the country. It had two clauses. First, it gave Parliament the power to determine a fixed amount as compensation to property owners. Meaning, they would not receive the market value and this could not be questioned in court. This was aimed at thwarting compensation-related cases which would slow down the nationalization of key industrial sectors. Your property can be taken away without payment of compensation. And property doesn't mean zamindaris, doesn't mean palaces. Your little shop, your little dispensary, your father's little workhouse. He may be repairing tires or he may be an artisan. Your own little home, your own one acre of land. Anything can be taken away without payment of compensation. All that has to be paid to you is an amount. Now, amount as any dictionary will tell you, means a sum of money. It does not. A rupee is a sum of money, a hundred rupees is a sum of money. Your property may be worth one thousand, but it can be taken away for a hundred rupees. Then the 25th Amendment inserted a fresh clause, Article 31C, under the fundamental right to property. Put simply, 31C said that no law could be challenged in court on the grounds of violating the fundamental rights to property, equality, and freedom, if that law intended to redistribute resources to achieve the common good. Gokhale said, quote, the individual right to property must yield second place to the public good. 
In his Loyola College lecture, Palkiwala painted a dire picture of how the 25th Amendment affected the ordinary citizen. And this, to my mind, is the utmost in utter contempt for the Constitution. There is no other word for it. It is the ultimate in contempt for the Constitution. What does it mean? Without abridging any of the fundamental rights, without even letting the people know that fundamental rights are gone, any law has only to be passed with these opening words, that this law is intended to give effect to the directive principle of the state policy regarding concentration of economic power. And what is the consequence? No fundamental rights shall apply. Such laws, intending to implement directive principles, could not be challenged in court, Palkiwala warned. He wrote to the Prime Minister, to H.R. Gokhale, and to Mohan Kumaramangalam expressing his concerns. In Parliament, Kumaramangalam, one of the architects of that amendment, responded. He said Palkiwala was correct in his understanding of the 25th Amendment. The government did intend to take away the power of judges from reconsidering any laws meant to achieve the common good. Kumaramangalam had long doubted the court's competence to decide correctly on matters of socio-economic importance. Professor of Law at Ambedkar University, Delhi, Lawrence Liang, explains the government's misgivings. So here was a judiciary that was consistently, in their opinion, ruling in favour of the elites, ruling in favour of, of you know, the princes and, and the bankers. They, on the other hand, were about poverty alleviation, right? which is the entire plank that Indira Gandhi came on. So their argument is that, just like Nehru had said, that this is an unelected set of elites who are actually coming in the way of the will of the people. Indira Gandhi basically says the same thing. Right? So there is a populist rhetoric that underlies you know, the entire attack on the judiciary uh, on the grounds that the judiciary is not even a legitimate institution when it comes to actually exemplifying or embodying you know, uh, popular will. So it is on a lower plane than the parliament ought to be. Kumaramangalam rested his case by saying that matters of grave social importance should be resolved in the realm of politics, not the courts. India's first Attorney General, M.C. Setalvad, who was by then nominated to the Rajya Sabha, criticised 31C. He said that it was, quote, making a departure from the basic concept of the Constitution. Setalvad elaborated that in the past, when governments diluted the right to property, they specified their objectives, like in the case of Zamindari abolition. But justifying the dilution on the basis of vague phrasing like, quote, the common good made the fundamental rights vulnerable. Despite these strong objections, little came of these debates. By early December, both houses passed the 25th Amendment with overwhelming support. In any case, the country wasn't paying much attention to these events. A crisis was escalating on the eastern border with Pakistan. Even the opposition rallied behind Indira Gandhi as she led India into war against Pakistan to liberate Bangladesh. Pakistan में पार्लियामेंट नहीं है पाकिस्तान की सरकार को जनता का समर्थन नहीं है यहां जनता के प्रतिनिधि बैठे हैं और दुनिया देख रही है आगे भी देखेगी कि इस देश में संकट की घड़ी में एक होकर और प्रत्युत्तर देने का सामर्थ्य है By 16th December West Pakistan forces had surrendered and Bangladesh would soon be independent the West Pakistan forces have unconditionally surrendered in Bangladesh. Dhaka is now the free capital of a free country. The entire nation rejoices in this historic... By the end of 1971, Gandhi's popularity had skyrocketed even further. The president gave her the Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian honour. Her fellow MPs gave her a rousing welcome in the Central Hall of Parliament. In footage from that day, Gandhi can be seen beaming in a beige sari as her colleagues garland her. Then, MPs across party lines showered her with praise for her visionary and courageous leadership. Indira Gandhi soaked up the adulation, but she was in no mood to rest. All the world admires a deed well done. And I think 
with all modesty, we can say that we have done this action well. But let us not forget that the road ahead is still long and very steep, and we have many peaks to scale. Let us hope that we can do this with the same spirit in which we have faced this challenge and that we will go ahead from peak to peak, raising our nation to new heights of quality and of excellence. In early 1972, she was back on the campaign trail for elections in 16 states and two union territories. Indira Gandhi told packed rallies that it was time to return to the bigger war, the war on poverty. Karibi Hatao was back in focus. Once again, the Prime Minister led her party to a historic victory when she swept the March 1972 State Assembly elections. There was no stopping the Indra wave, or so it seemed. A thousand kilometers southwest of Delhi, lawyers in Bombay were gathering forces to challenge the 24th and 25th Amendments. Their war room, so to speak, was across from the Bombay High Court at the office of the iconic Mullah and & Mullah and & Craigie Blunt & Caro, one of Bombay's oldest law firms. Its clients included a host of sugar mills, which had been fighting the takeover of their farmland for nearly a decade. That included the Godavari Sugar Mills, which had been a party in the Golaknath case. As we heard earlier, even though the Golaknath judgment said that fundamental rights could not be touched, the petitioners themselves gained nothing. The Godavari sugar mills had to hand over more than 10,000 acres to the state government. But the company was immediately back in the local courts, challenging fresh amendments to Maharashtra's land reform laws. Driving its legal strategy was Dharam Singh Popat, one of the senior partners at Mullah & Mullah. Popat had earlier worked with Nani Palkiwala in the Golaknath case. And when the 24th and 25th amendments were passed, he saw an opportunity for a fresh challenge. His longtime junior, Yazdi Dandiwala, tells us what drove him. Mr. Popat had a lot of work from sugar factories. He was closely associated with Somaya Group, which had Godavari sugar mills. Uh, and that Godavari sugar mills had three factories over in Maharashtra and in Karnataka. He was also associated with Kolhapur sugar mills. Now, these are the sugar factories who had lost their lands because most of these sugar factories in Maharashtra used to have huge areas of land which they used to use for cultivating sugarcane to ensure a assured supply of sugarcane for the factory. Now under the land reform laws of Maharashtra these lands were taken over and sugar factories were in a quandary as to what could be the remedy because this uh, takeover of uh, their farms was again governed by the provisions of the constitution which did not permit any challenge to the law. Popat joined forces with J.B. Dada Chandji, an old friend from Bombay who ran a bustling law firm in Delhi. He had worked with lawyers like M.K. Nambiar and Nani Palkhiwala on other constitutional cases. It was Nambiar who had brought the case of the Kerala monk, Keshavananda Bharati, to Dada Chandji's notice. The petition they'd filed in March of 1970 had been pending for two years, along with the petitions of the sugar mills and hundreds more, all challenging the land reforms. Then, in May 1972, there was fresh impetus. That month, Parliament passed the 29th Amendment to shield the Kerala Land Reforms Act of 1969 from court review. Keshavananda's original grouse was with this Kerala law, which allowed the land belonging to religious establishments to be taken over by the state. This new amendment said that the law could not be challenged. This gave Keshavananda's lawyers fresh grounds to argue against the constitutionality of the 24th and 25th Amendments. Sudhir Krishnaswamy, Vice-Chancellor of the National Law School Bangalore, who's written an extensive analysis of the Keshavananda Bharati case, speculates that Keshavananda stood out from other petitioners. 
Here he is explaining at a 2021 talk at the Bangalore International Center. The first and interesting thing that one picks up in Keshavananda is that the petitioner is a landholder for sure, but a landholder on behalf of a Matha trust, you know, a religious trust, which is a large landholder. And by bringing in the head of a Matha as the lead petitioner, it changed the political dynamic of the challenge to a certain extent. And this made a difference in the way the, the case came to be perceived. It did not tend to become a case relating to religious freedom. It didn't transform into a religious freedom case, but it certainly escaped the dynamic of the previous cases where it was a sort of landholder versus government battle. Looking back, it seems like Keshavananda's petition made for better optics compared to the bank nationalization and privy purse cases. Those petitioners had been stereotypical old elites and business interests. They fit snugly into the government's narrative that the moneyed classes were stalling its progressive reforms. Keshavananda's petition could hardly attract that kind of charge. We don't know if Popat and Dadachandji deliberately made Keshavananda the face of the case. It might just have been serendipity. Keshavananda's petition was already pending before the court and it was relevant to Popat and Dadachandji's concerns. That's all that might have mattered. Meanwhile, there were new setbacks. The country's top constitutional lawyer, M.K. Nambiar, who Keshavananda had first approached, was now sick. Palkiwala, who had been publicly speaking and writing against the amendments, was the next obvious choice. Surprisingly, he hesitated. Sandeep Thakur, one of the lawyers in Palkhiwala's team, tells us more. I think he was reluctant to appear because he had... I think he was reluctant to appear because he thought the case will be too long. The case would go on and on. This was my impression and what I heard from others. But I could never read his mind on this point. Why he was reluctant to appear. Because he appeared in the matter as a missionary. A missionary for fundamental rights. Although disappointed, Popat and Dada Chandji turned to the other towering figures of the bar. Senior advocate Arvind Datar tells us. Then they went to Mrs. Daftari. Daftari said that uh, this is going to take not only a lot of time, but I'll argue and other people will simply follow my argument. She was also not very keen. Then they went to Chagla. Chagla by that time was 73. And uh, uh, somebody said that this, this case is going to take a huge amount of time and he may not have the energy and the stamina to argue for days on end. It was going to be a massive case. The retired Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, M.C. Chagla, accepted the case despite his initial reluctance. Meanwhile, the solicitors had roped in newly appointed senior advocates, Anil Divan and Soli Sorabji. Divan had established a flourishing commercial law practice, and Sorabji ran a successful customs and excise practice. Sandeep Thakur was also inducted into the team. Well, by the time I was briefed with Divan, by the time I was briefed with Divan for the Keshav Nanda Bharti case, I was sent 10 days in advance to do some work in Delhi. There we had a conference with Divan. Divan and I were briefed, and we were to be led by somebody or the other. Fali had by then become additional solicitor general, so Fali was out of the picture. I was appearing for all the 11 sugar companies. They worked together. All the sugar companies worked together. In all, 28 parties challenged the government's amendments, either as petitioners or as interveners. Besides Keshavananda Bharati and the Godavari sugar mills, the list included companies such as Oriental Coal, Shetia Mining and Manufacturing, and the Belapur Sugar and Allied Industries. The coal, mining, and sugar factories funded the litigation. Two former rulers of princely states also joined the challenge. They were against the 26th Amendment, which proposed to do away with the privy purses. The team was beginning to take shape. On the 4th of August, 1972, they filed an application before a bench headed by the Chief Justice of India. They asked the court to expand the scope of Keshavananda's original petition to include the 24th, 25th, and 29th Amendments, the ones related to the amending power, right to property, and the Kerala land reforms. 
They said that the first two created a, quote, new constitution, different from the one adopted in 1950. On 9th August, M.C. Chagla appeared for Keshavananda, saying that the amendments went against the Golaknath ruling. Attorney General Nirende, the government's top law officer, did not oppose the plea. The government hoped that a hearing would lead to the Golaknath ruling being overturned. The next day, the bench admitted the plea and set a late October date for the hearings. The petitioners began preparing in earnest. They huddled in conferences in the Gothic building of the Bombay High Court Library or across the road at Popat's first floor office in Mullah House. By early October, the action shifted to Delhi. Just days before the hearings were to begin, Palkiwala was persuaded by Chagla and Daftari to take the case. With his arrival, the dream team was complete. Here's Dandiwala. Now, there we had a team of prominent lawyers, like we had, of course, Mr. Palkiwala, who was leading us. In addition, from Bombay, we had both Mr. Anil Divan and Mr. Soli Sorabji, as also Mr. Sandeep Thakur. We had other old stalwarts like C.K. Daftari, Mr. Chagla, then there were one or two gentlemen from South, Hyderabad and all those things. And our own lawyer team was almost like 20-25 people in that sense. Now, Mr. Palkiwala, Sorabji, Mr. Popert all were staying in Oberoi Hotel. And uh, from Bombay, there were three solicitors, Mr. Popert, who was representing this Kolapur Sugar Mill and Godavari Sugar Mill. Then there was Mr. Uh, uh, Bhakta from Kanga and Company. According to Anil Divan's recollections of the case, Palkiwala arrived in Delhi a few days before the hearings began. He asked Divan and Sandeep Thakur to find cases anywhere in the world where constitutional amendments had been struck down by the courts. The men combed through all the available literature, but they were left puzzled. No such case existed. Here's Thakur. Nani's face, the way he was depressed, my God. He Nani's face, he no the way he was depressed, he... my God. He said he was not getting help from anybody. He decided to appear in the case, but there was no help. Anil Divan suddenly walks into the room and he gave him Conrad's article. And then his face changed completely. He was like a baby who had first been denied something and then everything in the world came to him. How am I going to argue this case without a precedent, he thought. And then we showed him an article by Dieter Conrad and his face immediately lit up. He used this article to argue the case. Dieter Conrad was the German professor whose lecture made a cameo in the Golaknath case. He cited the example of 1930s Germany to show how badly things could go if the legislature had unchecked power of amendment. Palkiwala would go on to craft his arguments using Conrad's work. Could the 52-year-old star of the bar pull off another victory against the government? Would Palkiwala manage to protect the sanctity of fundamental rights? This time, the stakes were higher than ever before. The future of the Indian constitution itself hung in the balance. Join us in the next episode of Friend of the Court as Palkiwala argues for 29 days before the largest ever Supreme Court bench. Until then, I'm your host, Raghu Karnad. Friend of the Court is a project by the Anil Divan Foundation. Thank you to the guests on this episode. Arvind Dattar, Gautam Bhatia, K.K. Venugopal, Lawrence Liang, Namita Vahi, Sandeep Thakur, and Yazdi Dandiwala. The show was written and researched by Bhavya Dore and Ramya Bodupalli. Legal research and fact-checking was provided by Aishwarya Chaturvedi. The scripts were edited by Supriya Nair. The show is produced by Gaurav Vaz, audio production and music score by Sachi Rajithyaksha, and mastered by Ayan De. Lawrence Liang, Ranveer Singh, Sham Divan, and Vivek Divan were advisors on this series. Special thanks to Anand Thakur, Geeta Sehgal, Homi Ranina, Lalita Kumaramangalam, and Vimal Thakur.